from Calgary pretty early on a Sunday morning to get going, but okay. here they are, Reverend Tony Hagee. I love you, and I accept your love. There was that opening statement of my teacher, Dr. Tom Casa, on Sunday morning. And I was thinking about it because I wanted to bring us into an awareness that this is a lineage of thought. It didn't start with Ernest Holmes, but in this particular way that we do it, it did. And I'm a fourth generation religious science minister. Ernest Holmes taught my teacher's teacher, Barney. Barney taught Tom, and he taught me. It's not that each of them had the truth to hand on, it's that each of them had prepared the ground so that their seed could prosper. I was Tom's, I was in Tom's congregation for years before I became uh, interested in becoming a minister. I finally went to a Silomar one year and the ground had been tilled sufficiently for something to take root. And that's what I want to talk about today. You know, all of us live as a field. This is a great time of year in springtime. You know, how many of you plant gardens? Yeah. Plus, we're in the middle of farming land. And I grew up in the farming area. And I know all about tilling the soil. You know, when our ancestors first came here, the ground was so tough that you needed to have a four horse plow to break it. Because the grass had been here so long that it wouldn't give up. The fescue, which is the native grass here, is a tough and hardy beast. And it was seeded and reseeded and the root structure was deeply seeded and how many of us have thoughts like that? <laughs> All of us have habits of thought that are so deeply entrenched that it, coming on Sunday morning, helps, breaks it up a little bit, moves it around a little bit, but you know, if you plant seeds into that ground, what's going to happen? The old existing root suck will re-emerge and take over. How many of you have experienced that? You know, you come away from Sunday morning all inspired, and by Tuesday afternoon, you're doing what you've always done. That's why we used to have midweek services. Because you needed to get that re-initiation, if you will, uh, break up the sod a little bit more. And yet, all of us in our deepest desire want to break the sod up. We want to plant new thoughts. We want to have a life that moves beyond where we've been. But mostly we're waiting for the seeds to do the work. We listen to the best talks on tape. We read the best books. And we're hoping that those new ideas will take root and transform our lives. But I'm here to tell you it will not be enough. You know, there's a reason why we're a teaching philosophy. And it isn't because we have so much new information to give you that you need to study for years. It's that it takes years to break up those thought patterns that have taken hold of your life <coughs> and persist. I've been a minister now for almost 20 years. I was a student of this kind of teaching for 20 years prior to that. And I've been a student my whole life. So in my ongoing discovery of life, you know, I've always been seeking to plant new seeds, always been seeking to have a new experience of life, always reaching beyond what was there. And guess what? When I wake up in the morning, the weeds are back. One of the things about being fertile ground, and our minds are fertile, they allow things to grow and expand. Now guess what grows and expands the best and easiest and quickest? <laughs> the things that have the deepest roots. By the time you were three, you had a personality that you still have. 
I want you to think about that, because you might already know a three-year-old or so in your life, and you can look back at there and you can see, oh, there is the seed of who that will be. It is fully and completely manifested. Does that mean it won't get bigger, won't become more complex, won't become more convoluted, like some of us, we get convoluted as we age, not simpler. We just become trickier and more involved. Unfortunately, for most of us, that means we become more self-involved. We convolute in upon ourselves, and so our stories begin to develop an, a relationship with themselves that it makes it very difficult for outside things to become added on. You see, this journey is one of awakening, not one of adding to it. If anything, it's really a process of you opening up and letting go of things that you recognize that you picked up because at the time it made sense, but really haven't served you much in a very long time. I've been semi-retired for a couple of years, and I've decided recently to go back into the active ministry. So I'm looking at, well, what do I need to let go of to make this easy to move? I have a very big house. I don't know if you have a very big house, but even if you have a small house or even an apartment, I bet if you go through your closets and your drawers, you find there are tons of things that you're holding on to that you really don't have a use for at the moment. Clothes that don't fit, you know, styles that have come and gone, but you're going to keep it because, you know, styles repeat themselves eventually. <laughs> so if you just hold on to it long enough, it'll be stylish once again. The furniture that is missing one piece of the set but you're keeping it because the other pieces are fine. That you're going to hold on to because someday somebody will want it. Now, I grew up in the prairie, so I know what it's like. If you live on a farm, nothing ever goes away. It might park in your front lawn like your 50-year-old harvester that you can no longer get parts for because who knows, you might be able to get a piece off of that to fix something you need now. The screws and bolts and nuts of life are sitting in jars in my basement. I understand what it's like. But really and truly, as we start to unfold this, it's the mental accumulation of stuff that is in our way. And uh, I wrote a series of books a number of years ago. and. I unconsciously put something in it that told the whole story. And a minister friend of mine recently read it back to me as far as this, this line in your, in your book is just fantastic. He said, it tells exactly the price of transformation. And what I wrote in my book was, in order to have the life that you want, what you must give up is the life that you have. You see, the life that you have is all of the stuff that you've picked up that may or may not work, that may or may not actually apply anymore, but because it's yours, you are loath to release it. And the past does not allow the future unless the future looks just like the past. I, you know, I grew up in the United States, and. Being on the prairie, you can hear all about the Great Westward Push. Not so much here in Canada because the railroads were here pretty much at the same time that people were. But in the States, people came first. And usually they came with everything they owned in the wagon. Usually somewhere around where I grew up on the prairies, you started to see the accumulation of things that people discovered about halfway across they no longer really need it. And then, of course, you have the communities where people decided, if I have to give up my stuff, I'm not going. <laughs> and so we have lots of towns, like the town my little brother lives in in Platte, South Dakota, which is about the width of three wagons. <laughs> and people settled there and grew their farms, and their children and their children's children and their great-grandchildren are still there. Because when they got there, it was give up the stuff to move forward or stay, and they stayed. 
Most of us live in our own little town in our head. We've gotten to a certain place in our life where we are unwilling to let go of the stuff we brought with us. Now, I'm not saying the stuff that you brought with you is, isn't valuable. You know, my history is probably the most precious thing I have because everything I know, I learned from it. But everything I learned is actually in the way for what else is possible. And at some point, the choice before us is really to let go of what we know in order to become ignorant again. In the Bible, Jesus, the story about Jesus and the little children it says, suffer the children to come forward, for such is the nature of the kingdom of God. And what did he mean? He means they don't know anything yet. They're still open to discover. They're still available for what might be possible. The rest of you guys, I'm beating you in the head with a hammer, and all I'm ever getting is a little gravel knocked loose. Give me a shot at actually impacting the future. You see, for all of us, that's that rebirth moment that allows us to go back to newness and go back to being available for growth and for knowing and for becoming. You see, it's what we are that's in the way. Not what we are as the infinite potential of God, but what we are as the already manifested journey to this point. How many of you have the experience that there are paths that you might have taken in your life that are gone? Yeah, because in our point of view, the way we view ourselves, life is a linear journey from which every time you make a choice, you kill an option. That's why they call it decision, you know, like to decide is like fratricide and patricide and homicide, which means to kill off that which went before. We think that just because we made a choice way back when, that means that line of possibility is now impossible. But the real awakening is to realize that everything is available from everywhere. From every point in life, every option still exists. It merely means the pathway to it is different. You know, if you go to Edmonton, you can still go to Calgary. You can get to Red Deer from any place on the planet. It isn't an either or situation. It merely means that from point A to point B may be a different journey. Because time itself is merely a location. And as we allow that awareness to expand in our life, we start to realize, I have all the freedom I need. I have everything necessary here to be or do anything, to be or go anywhere. That there is nothing in my way but my belief that I had to do it a certain way. You see, as I open up to that possibility, I start to realize what Ernest Holmes is talking about. And treat when we don't make anything happen. We really open up pathways through which things may happen. And may is a word that means allowance. It is not a manufactory term. You don't may things into existence in a factory. It is an opening to the possibility that we are inherently and as we accept that possibility as our nature, not as something we've earned, not as something that we had to go get, we start to realize we are the fertile ground. We may have to break up a few sods and clods of old thought that are persistent in order to access it and to make it available. But once we do, the fertile ground is who we are. You know, in the parable of the seeds, Jesus says, you know, when you throw seed on, you know, the sower goes out and he sows his seeds, and some of it falls on the rocks and is perished. 
Some of it falls on the hard ground and does not nourish and flourish. But some of it falls into the fertile ground from which magnificence and multiplicity arises. We get to decide what kind of ground the seeds of our thought will fall on. I'm not saying it's easy. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to be fertile ground today. You are fertile ground. That's not the issue. Are you willing to till the soil? Are you willing to do the work that confronts and exposes and releases those thoughts and habits of thought which persistently cre create the experience you're having? Not by saying, oh, the damn thoughts. You know, my parents, if they'd just been better, I would have different thoughts. It wouldn't matter. You would just have different clods that you have to break up. Today, you are the farmer. The ground is your nature. What will you do to prepare it? Will you take ownership? Are you still waiting for your neighbor to come over and till your fields? Today is the day. You know, there's no tomorrow in universal thought. It's one of the things that we talk about, you know. We have all the Einsteinian science which says, you know, <clears throat> time and space are somehow related and it's really that time is a function of place rather than something in and of itself. It is from where you're viewing currently or where you viewed once. It has no permanent existence as a thing. And what we're discovering as the quantum mechanics has developed, as people start to look at this, we realize that in the place of creation, there is no time. When something ha is created, it is. And once it is, it always was. Because how could something be that didn't have at least its potential in existence before its form arrived? There is no then here. There's no tomorrow, no yesterday. There is only what is going on in your creative aspect now. You see, whatever you said to the answer question I asked a few minutes ago is irrelevant. What are you doing now to till the soil? Are the words I'm speaking just bouncing off the clods? Or have you busted up a space for something to actually reach your fertile ground? It doesn't mean there are not events and things that might happen which will make it difficult. It doesn't mean there aren't forces in play that will challenge you. It merely means those things are, in fact, irrelevant to your creation. Thomas Trower writes in his book, The Edinburgh Lectures, in a very, which I think is probably, it's a really small chapter in the very beginning of the book, which he talks about something he calls his vortex theory. I mean, when I read this the first time, I didn't catch it. And when I heard it was something really important and I needed to know what it meant, I went back and tried to find it and couldn't find it. It's in a little chapter called Further Considerations. It doesn't even have a title of its own. <laughs> and it only takes up about a paragraph. But basically what it says is that once an idea is <coughs> situated in mind, it, of its own, what I would call now, specific gravity, attracts into it everything necessary to drop out of the ether into experience. That one, an idea in mind, once situated, once given efficient, sufficient form and structure to be self-contained, will in and of itself, attract everything necessary for it to come into experience. 
You see, we try to make things happen. It's just like planting a plant and then pulling it up every few minutes to see if the roots are working. Not going to be a very effective way to have a healthy plant. Today I'm asking you to take one step in belief. Not to believe in the science of mind. It doesn't need your belief. Not to believe in the law of cause and effect. Totally irrelevant. Doesn't need your belief. I want you to take a step in belief of your fertile ground that the seeds you plant are sufficient of into themselves to draw into them everything necessary to manifest and to allow them the process that allows them to tr attract into their existence that which is necessary. And how do I till that soil? I rest in expectancy. That which I have put in motion will manifest in its time. And I rest in expectancy. Not expectation, which has a definite time and place and space and shape and form. And because it has that, it also has not that. It has the condition under which it is not so. But in expectancy, I allow for it to be without denial. In continued resting in expectancy, I accept that it is happening. And I merely am present awaiting its arrival. So I invite you this week to go forth in expectancy, to break up some old idea and allow a new thought to come into form for you, and to sit in restful expectancy as you allow it, the time and space for its unfolding. I love you, and I accept your love. Namaste. Thank you. That's great. Do I shut it off? Yep. Do I shut it off? Just hit record again. Well, Reverend Tony always gives us something new and fresh.